good evening uh, to everyone in India and Australia, and a good morning to America, and a good afternoon to Ghana. Uh, my mm. name is Rohit, and I have the honor of being your moderator. I am the co-founder of uh, Collabso Solutions Limited, a company which is focused on employability for fresh graduates, as well as now uh, re-employability of young professionals. Our initiative is called Whiteboard Labs and has a single agenda of creating employment and employability in the times of Industry 4.0, um, now compounded by the uh, pandemic. Today's session will focus on the aspect of learning to create abilities within ourselves to cater to that change and remain relevant. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharji, uh, would you uh, please welcome no everybody and, and uh, um, give the welcome address uh, so we can move forward. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is the second uh, series of our webinar series and I uh, welcome you all on behalf of Science Foundation, Times of India Group. Uh, Times Foundation, as you already know, is the philanthropic wing of Times of India Group, largest media house in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's headed by Srimati Indu Jain, our chairperson of the group and uh, the owner of Times of India. And uh, we, uh, as a group, always have been very sensitive to the social issues, and uh, the current scenario also uh, demands our participation. And this webinar series is based on opportunities post-COVID and during COVID era. And uh, it's a pretty apt uh, series which is going on. And uh, we hope to take a lot of learning from the expert panels. And Rohit leading it it's super efficiently like last time. And uh, so I welcome on board everybody. I welcome Professor Madgul, Google, uh, uh, welcome, Professor S.P. Singh. Uh, welcome, Kuku. If I pronounce your name properly. <laughs> Kweku. Kweku. Yeah. And welcome, Rohit, again. Yeah. Thank you. So Thank you so much. Rohit. Thank you, everyone, once again. Uh, we have read and um, heard a lot of advice from experts on how this time can be used for learning new skills and upgrading professionally, etc., etc. But uh, the question remains, and in my mind, as well as in many other people's minds, I'm sure, uh, uh, what do we learn? And how do we learn? I think these are crucial questions, and uh, uh, this is how, uh, and this is where we look to our panel to, uh, you know, uh, help us uh, wade through this whole uh, uh, maze. Today, as I see it, we are faced with a situation of uh, human jobs versus uh, machine jobs. You know uh, how and what we do learn to carve out our own human role in the new economy uh, and remain relevant is the big question in my mind today. Uh, with 48% jobs as we know them today, moving to artificial intelligence and uh, and uh, robotics by 2022. Where does that leave us is uh, a question we need to uh, think about. But, you know, the good news is that while 70 million uh, uh, job roles will get changed, about 130 million will get generated. And of those 130 million, a huge number will be what I call human jobs. Jobs that cannot be replaced by machines. But which will need a very different skill set. We need to firstly understand what is the landscape, and that is where I would like to uh, draw upon you, Kweku. Uh, can you paint us that picture of where we are? And how do you see the future of work? So we are in an age of uh, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. And more and more, sophisticated developing uh, uh, digital technologies. And as the days go by, as we speak, the technologies become more and more sophisticated. 
Um, and jobs are threatened, yes. But really, this is no different to the automation that has been happening in our societies all over the world in the last 50 years. For the last 50 years, as technology has been developing, we keep hearing in the newspapers, in the media, every day, jobs are threatened. Jobs are going to be threatened by this. Jobs are going to be threatened by that. And it's no different today. The human being is very re resilient and very adaptive. And so no matter what has been thrown at it, no matter what the new technologies have been thrown at it, we've managed to find a way around. I mean, come on guys, let's look at it now. Let's, let's look at our faces on this platform right now. We're all over 50 years old, and yet we're using the latest technology. We're using the te latest technology in order to be able to communicate with ourselves and with our audience out there. We are adapting to this technology. None of us are saying, oh, I'm so used to meeting face to face all this time, I, I can't use this. I have to meet you face to face. No, we're not saying that. We're saying, well, if this technology is, exists, let's learn how to use it and be able to communicate and advance what we know, and not only advance what we know, but teach the people behind us, which is very commendable, what you're doing by White Labs, for example. So yes, the, the, the picture is scary for those who don't understand that we are resilient and we will overcome it. So AI has the ability to take all our jobs. Not only AI, but 3D technology can literally print anything out there. Uh, to, we, in Ghana, we're using 3D technology to print PPE, um, personal protective equipment, um, to print all sorts of things, masks, to print all sorts of things that we need to fight the COVID pandemic. Uh, it's crazy, and I'm sure it's the same in India and other developing countries. It's crazy the inventions that people are coming out because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. It, it, it's incredible and very interesting. So this is how we respond as human beings to what's, what's going out there. Now, at, as you rightly said, as the new technologies are developing and people are having to change mindset and develop new skills, there are other areas, traditional areas, that are becoming even more important. The development of herbal medicine. It's, it's rising to the fore all of a sudden as maybe one of the things that we can use to combat COVID. Agriculture and food food um, sustainability has become very important. It's, 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 it's food security has now taken on a whole new meaning. Uh, how do we supply food to each other? Things like water, the provision of water during this, this uh, COVID pandemic time, the sewage and sanitation systems, how do we take care of our health and our environment? And suddenly all these things become, come to the fore and become very important. So as um, opportunities are generated for those who are digitally and technologically educated, new, new skills are being developed for those who are traditionally skilled in terms of agriculture and those other types of industry. All of a sudden, the care of the mind, the health of the mind, has become much, much more so important. Because if we're stuck at home, what happens to our mental health? So those kinds of psychological skills become important. And then what about the traditional skills of language and of um, transferring knowledge to children? I mean, those mass of children out there who can no longer go to traditional schools but have to stay at home and learn. It means that we have to develop new ways of reaching that five-year-old child through this, through this laptop, through, through the, this device. How do I transfer that knowledge 
to the five-year-old, the 10-year-old, the 15-year-old, the university student? And how do we maintain that? How do we keep that up? So therefore, what does it mean for the people who are behind this? People in the cloud who we do not see, who we do not know, who are maintaining this Zoom for us to be able to stay on it. What are they having to learn? And what we've got to understand about Zoom, for example, is that they were totally, totally unprepared for this COVID situation. And people were able to start hacking into it, the security. But what did they do? They adapted straight away to improve their security. As that was happening, Microsoft and other people were saying, oh my God, this is an opportunity to, to do things that Zoom cannot do. So all of a sudden, Microsoft Teams becomes very important as well. Um, there are, there are uh, there's Skype, who has suffered from the popularity of Zoom and Microsoft Teams and suddenly doesn't seem to be able to keep up with what Zoom. So there's all sorts of layers and layers of paradigm shifts of different skills that we have to adopt and so on and so forth. But here, what are we here for? And we're concerned with the transmission of uh, knowledge, knowledge transfer, the transmission of education, especially from us experienced ones to those who are learning from us, those who need our experience and knowledge. And how do we do, do that used in this medium? How do I teach a group of students in India from Ghana? Now, the other thing that's become very important, it's given those of us in third world countries a global reach that we did not have before. We, we were able to be relevant to people in America, from India, from, from Calcutta, from Accra, from Kingston, Jamaica. We're able to educate people in so-called first world advanced countries. We're, ab we're able to educate people in Germany. So I have training programs and the people coming on there are from Australia. They're from Mexico. They're from um, um, Orlando in USA. They're from Minneapolis. They're from, I've, I've had so much interaction with people in Mumbai and, and so on and so forth. And, and I, am, I am a little person, um, uh, Prof, Prof McDougall knows where I stay in Accra, Ghana, in a little place called Osu. And I'm working from there right now. And I have this global reach that I would never have had if this technology hadn't existed for me to be able to do so. How powerful is that? That is super powerful. What it also means is that um, a, a young housewife in India who has recipes, a, a special biryani recipe that has been transferred to her by her mother and her great grandmother is able to use this technology and all of a sudden become, become a, um, a, an internet, um, uh, she can go viral because she has these recipes that she puts in her biryani. And when she puts that on YouTube, when her young teenage te um, tech savvy kid is able to put that on YouTube and do a, a series, from biryani to chapatis, from chapatis to fish curry, and so on and so forth. All of a sudden, this young woman uh, in India, who's a housewife and does not go out to work, her husband goes out to work, is, is suddenly becoming an internet phenomenon and is able to monetize this using this technology in her home. And this is what the internet has given us. It's given us um, democratization of knowledge and has given us democratization of the media. These things are very powerful things and those in turn can be monetized and it becomes very powerful. Now imagine a situation where we're all losing our jobs. COVID has hit many industries and the weaker of those uh, in those industries have had to lay off people and people are now at home without anything to do. The more flexible within those industries who are able to adapt to the situation using technology, using mobile te 
technology are the ones who have been able to ride the tide and are somehow managing to continue to do so. But what, what about those people who've lost their jobs and their livelihoods? To be able to pay rent, to be able to buy food, to live, it's become a really um, important, a real uh, touch and go situation. You're living on the edge. So what do we do? Is it just enough to impart knowledge? No. That knowledge has to be something that they can use to get that rupee, to get that dollar, to get that pound, to get that CD so that they can feed their families and be able to have something to live on. That's the kind of knowledge that we have to impart. Are we going to impart philosophy, um, Einstein theory of relativity, or some philosophy of how the universe works? Or are we going to impart knowledge that gives something, something that they can turn uh, into money that will make them, uh, you know, that will put something in their pocket to feed their families. These are some of the real, real issues that we have to think about and our responsibility in terms of when we impart knowledge and how we give people hope through the use of this technology and this kind of distance learning. So those are the kind of things we really have to look at. Thank got you. it, got it. Thank you, thank you, Peku. So uh, let me pose my question first to Professor Singh. Uh, so how can, uh, can you tell us how adults actually learn? What is the process? What are the drivers or motivators? Uh, you know, you know that whole, uh, broadly, what is that whole process? Thank you, Rupin, and thank you, Peku, for giving us such a wonderful perspective uh, and enabling us to launch into this discussion. Uh, the process of learning is invariably the same across the spectrum, whether it is children or adult. Uh, learning is something about which we are beginning to explore. And we know very little, but we know one thing, that it is caused because of neural firing that takes place within our synapses while we create yep. new network and in a very nebulous way, nebulous I say, because yet we are trying to explore about it, explore some data and content into it. Uh, what happens is, uh, for activation of hippocampus, which is the seat of memory, we need certain degree of novelty. A child approaches the world as everything new. And therefore, the neural firing that promotes learning in a child is quite intense. But as we grow along and as the benchmark which you gave, by the time we become 18 years old, the world becomes a dull, dreary and a stale place. And much of that excitement which a child has or the sense of wonder that characterizes a child is lost. At the same time, a child, because of the way we grow up is also can be conditioned by adults and responds to their expectations. By the time we grow up, we have a well-defined self of censored and our self sense of selfhood in a way gives us internal locus of control, which means we won't do anything that is just told to us. We need to be quite independent, quite assertive in our decision making and action. And very often we find that adult learners become disinterested in learning. Uh, learning never stops actually, but the traditional way of learning, they move on to the world of work. For 18 years old, the work of world is learning. When, a fa when someone probably gets married or has a child, the way people learn changes. So we are constantly skilling ourselves, reskilling or adapting new skills all along the life. Only thing is, the way we do that continues to change. So what is extremely important is to motivate people is to add some kind of reward into learning. The reward can come from to see the relevance of the knowledge which they have uh, acquired, how that knowledge is going to help. That gives them a sense of serotonin or dopamine push. You know, uh, 
in our prefrontal cortex we, we have that place called uh, nucleus accumbens which is called the pleasure center of the brain and if this pleasure center is excited we are likely to carry on that activity just to experience that pleasure once more and that pleasure can be gained when we see that we have acquired something which is useful for us which is relevant for us which can enable us to facilitate our goal and it is very important in all the learning programs to continually affirm and assert what we have gained and how it is important for uh, the person in order to make him relevant to the work scenario to have a greater control over life to have a greater control over a relationship or whatever would be his short term and long term objectives in addition to that uh, group learning can work wonders because each one of us uh, the way learning works is the new stimulus that we get interacts with the chunk of knowledge which we already have and therefore it is very important that we work in groups where people from diverse backgrounds get to interact with each other and when we see their perspective we we are further fired we get to see and these are the moments when we really uh, we have that kind of revelatory insights which really enable us to have deeper knowledge and understanding at the same time there should be a greater emphasis on application and problem solving because learning does not take place only when we are actively engaged at learning actually there is very little that our active engaged mind can take in but when we sleep when we dream when our mind is working the subconscious mind is working at a problem lot of learning takes place and especially this is called the diffused mode of learning and in adult learning paradigm this is very significant and important and we can always promote and facilitate diffused learning if we give some problems leave it there make an applied issue and as people ponder over problem you know right from the archimedes eureka to benjin's uh, benjin ring being discovered we have a whole body of scientific literature where suddenly it was a moment of epiphany when some startling great discovery was made people find that matter is a wave and all those uh, you know the theory of relativity all of them came as just as an image an image uh, which was a result of diffuse learning that took place over a period of time so that is one way as we encourage exploration as we encourage kind of uh, problem solving in an adult learner we can really facilitate those things another very significant thing is that we continue to offer feedback an adult learner feedback is extremely critical for an adult learner because adult learner needs to always ha has many distractions and has limited time and therefore feedback can critically either facilitate him motivate him and keep him moving towards the direction of his goal another important thing is to break uh, the whole learning into manageable chunks if we try to learn too much we get frustrated and uh, we become despondent too soon and adults can't afford it with so many new options that are always waiting for them with so many stressors out there so those learning chunks have to be manageable and of course uh, we have to engage any learning course that we design has to engage with the adult learner as a whole person we say that it has to have emotions what is something that ai cannot simulate is that it cannot have emotions ai cannot get angry and therefore it is very important very significant to engage the whole person and around these points which we just discussed we can uh, understand the process of adult learning and incorporate it in any learning program to achieve the optimum kind of effectivity uh, thank you sir uh, at this point there's before i move on to professor mcdougal uh, there's a question 
and uh, somebody is asked uh, and i quote uh, i just want to ask about the additional or new areas or skills which will be beneficial for majority of professionals maybe the beginners or those who have good experience in their domain or who are in trouble in terms of job loss or professional growth well uh, while you've not given your name sir but uh, my answer uh, i would like to answer this myself and uh, the answer is this that uh, yes uh, we have compiled a list of uh, new areas of skills uh, industry wise which may be helpful for people uh, we will be circulating that uh, right after this webinar um, uh, within uh, about 24 hours and coming to the next observation uh, about people who may be in uh, trouble in terms of job loss or professional growth yes we have an answer to, uh, not an answer but a possible solution to that uh, which we will talk about at the end of this uh, webinar so please hold on please be patient uh, we are just building up the logic after which we will absolutely uh, uh talk about the practical side of it right uh, the, uh, there's another observation which says no doubt experts are telling about e learning its pros but what about accessibility in fact in developed countries it has not proved so much success what about developing ones there is such a urban rural divide in developing countries in its accessibility equity and equality what about that so my answer to you sir is this that uh, uh, professor singh has just talked about uh, there are two things here one is the physical aspect which is accessibility and the other is the learning aspect which is the learning process and i think dr uh, singh has just talked about the learning process uh, uh and the learning process for adults is different and which is just uh, talked about as far as the accessibility goes we talked about it the last time and uh, uh we will address that uh, if that's your concern but we'll take it offline uh for the moment let us move on to professor mick dougal and uh, my question to you sir is this how do you see adult learning happening in a world today where learning unlearning and learning again will be the norm so you know in preparing for this panel you know a couple of days ago we began to talk about the way that humans learn and we contrasted it with the way machines learn we artificial intelligence learns uh let me summarize by, by proposing that humans learn inductively while machines actually do not learn they deduce computers can perform millions of brute force calculations they can add subtract multiply divide but they cannot induce humans create algorithms to approximate induction for ai i believe that's where we are now and this is what quaker was talking about as i said earlier and i think it's important for the audience to hear this our minds learn and process information a bit like google searches each new piece of information we absorb is categorized and placed with other similar bits in something like a basket as our learning proceeds these baskets interconnect and are categorized into larger baskets that clump into larger baskets when we receive a new bit of information or ask a novel question our mind searches the baskets for an answer if it does not find one it creates a new basket Sometimes our minds then search previous baskets that seem related in an effort to determine if previously categorized information sit, fits better in a new basket than the new one. When that happens, we have a physical experience, an epiphany, an aha moment, a rush, as Dr. Singh was saying. That's, ad that's adaptation. The adaptation that Quaker was talking about, that rush, is a physical thing. As Dr. Singh was saying, it's rooted in our neural pathways, hippocampus, the serotonin you know uh response all of that so the thing i wanted to emphasize is that our reasoning means this means that our reasoning is always in motion and we should be troubled by what dr singh said that as we move away from childhood we kind of get tired of learning we should be troubled by that 
because that is not our natural state. At best, we are lifelong learners. And that means that preview, that also means that this has kind of been, you know, come up with the pandemic. Everybody has a cure for the pandemic and the scientists have not been waiting to peer review the stuff and publish it. They've just been coming out with stuff. And the politicians who want certainty on this are worried because they, the, the population wants certainty. But the, but the wake up call is there is no certainty. And the pandemic has really shown us that there is no certainty. Um, that means that previous things that we thought we knew can be revisited and revised just by this process that I described. So certainty is not actually part of our life, our life experience, though we often wish to believe it is, or we are told to believe it is. And I think this is this transition from childhood to adulthood that Dr. Singh was talking about. We are told as we get older that things are predictable, that they're certain, that if we just follow a certain script, we will, we will be okay, we will survive, but our minds really don't like that. Our college in the United States have grown up during a period when standardized testing was used to measure the performance of their teachers as well as themselves. The teachers taught to the test to protect their jobs. The students got accustomed to being taught to give answers that are likely to be on a standardized test. In other words, they were taught to think like machines. This is not a good thing for many reasons. The most important of which is that they must be prepared to operate at their highest level, which means constantly reviewing and reprocessing information already gathered, as well as information newly acquired. A couple of additional points. Our brains process information acquired through all of our five senses the same way. This is why a musical score can shake up baskets of information we have acquired visually, say, our reading, and can lead us to new levels of creativity. I wonder when Einstein had his, you know, his aha moment, was he listening to Bach, for example? You know, had he just gone out and danced with his wife? Had he just had a great meal, a smell, a great smell? Um, so in this new world that Kwaku describes that is almost all visual and interactive and te technological, we have to remember to tend to those other four senses. You know, maybe this, I don't know if you can do this with an app, maybe we need to recommend that people form small physical groups. The study circles, you know, model is a very good one. That people form small physical groups like Kwaku in the little place that he says he lives in in Osu. There's four or five families there. Maybe they all need to be talking to each other and getting their empathic interaction with people who they know and are safe. And then, then that group, in, you know, connects you know, virtually with, with group, you know, other groups on the internet. So, as, as again, as Dr. Singh said, our empathic and vagus neurophysiology features in this process of learning as well, also affecting baskets and also working shakeups. And so they have to be tended to as well, just to survive. Um, the last thing, you know, is that the gap between how we learn and how machines and AI operates will require succeeding generations to know more about both. For now, those of us who have human learning energy to contribute that kind of Google search process I was talking about, but are behind on AI and robotics. You know, Rohit was kind enough to walk me through this whole process, which is the only reason why you can both see and hear me, because <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself. Um, for now, those of us who have human learning energy to contribute, but are behind on AI and robotics, we need translators to bridge the gap. Eventually, people doing our kind of work, the kind of work that I do and Dr. Singh does, um, we'll all have those new skills themselves, kind of like Quaco. Quaco says he's over 50, but he's still way younger than I am. Um, <laughs> but, but in the meantime, our translators can also be apprentices. They can learn what we know as they teach us what they know. Um, I had like, you may have seen me taking notes. I took a million notes. I mean, while Dr. Singh was talking, and, Dr. and while Quaco, Dr. Quaco, I'm gonna call you Dr. Quaco, you Dr. Quaco. <laughs> while he was too. Um, you know, the mental health, the empathic communication, the hippocampus. Dr. Singh, you know, what you said about, you know, everything is new when we're children. Actually, things are supposed to be new to us for our whole lives. And when we were homo sapiens, uh, we are homo sapiens, but we, when we lived as hunter-gatherers, 185,000 years out of our 200,000-year existence, the way we're, 
the way we live like in large groups, this is only like 5% of our time on the planet. We are not genetically engineered to live like this. I'll tell you, Homo sapiens before agriculture and while we were, you know, out in the bush and making things, people think, oh, it was so terrible. We lived longer. We had to treat, we had to get past childbirth. There were a lot of, you know, the infant mortality was high, maternal child, you know, child, uh, maternal mortality was high. But once you got past that, you could live to be 120, 130 years old, right? And all during that time, you had to learn. You had to know what the ants were doing. You had to know what the trees were saying to you. You had to know where the leopards were, where the deer were. Um, but even with that, people still had time to relax. I mean, they hunted and they gathered and then they chilled. I mean, they had some wine or smoked some weed or had sex or whatever they did. You know, so this thing about our learning shutting down as we get older, it doesn't have to happen. And I think all of the people who are right here on this panel, I think we're all examples of that. Each one of us, I can hear from Kwaku, I can hear from Dr. Singh, from Rowett, we're all still excited about learning new things. Why can't everybody have that, right? There's a, there's a reason. I have another book that, that, uh, that Rowett doesn't know about. It's called Democracy on a Human Scale. And what I'm going to be talking about is how do we make this, how do we make this life accessible to people not on a mass scale because we're not engineered, you know, to do that. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure I went way off from what Ro had asked me, but I had these things I just had to say based on what everybody else was saying. No, no, absolutely, uh, and that was uh, very interesting. Uh, and but at the same time, you know, I, I need to correlate what you guys said uh, to what uh, we are going through here, and for that, I will call upon. Uh, I'll request. Uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Rajeshi Bhattacharji to uh, uh, sir, you you mentioned that earlier that uh, uh, you were doing uh, your clinicals at, and your um, uh, consultations uh, wide uh, the computer, you know, uh, telediagnostics or telemedicine and whatever you call it. Interesting. Yeah. So so my uh, I have a question here. You know, uh, if we consider such a shift as part of the new normal, what happens to the technicians and staff which were part of a clinic earlier? We would like to understand this to be able to understand how a shift typically may take place. Uh, and this is just an example. Uh, we're not meaning to, you know, really uh, focus on this, but uh, just an example how a shift due to uh, the various uh, changes happening may take place in terms of skills? It depends. Uh, so good question. So it depends on how big the clinic is. Okay. If it's a, uh, so let's start with a small clinic setup. When a small clinic setup goes on teleconsulting, the small clinic setup doesn't have too many technicians per se. It would have a receptionist and maybe the doctor. So now what the receptionist is doing is doing the same work as they were doing it manually. Now they're doing it technologically. They are now adapt to understanding and shifting out. Uh, so what they're doing more is doing the marketing bit. So because the lineup of all the consultancy is now done through technology. So the person sitting there and actually working at the receptionist and taking down appointments doesn't need to do that. So the platforms that we use now, there are a lot of platforms which doctors use. Most of them are free or very kind of um, minor payments required. Uh, they sift out all the appointments in accordance to your availability slot. So it's all automatically done. So what the receptionist has to do is to now train them themselves into doing digital marketing in doing and also following up with patients if they are actually coming online if they have taken the appointment and not being there so an alert automatically goes to the patient but, but still the receptionist does that so that's part of a small clinic but to be very very, very honest the work of a receptionist will go away in due course of time the doctor once gets trained into Technology, most of us are now getting trained into technology, would do it on their own and wouldn't require somebody, and actually wouldn't require somebody to be paid 
to do the needful. We could pay to the technology platform and get the same work done. So the receptionist has to upgrade themselves into digital, like what I told you, into digital uh, marketing and likewise, or upskill themselves into some clinical activities like uh, reading out reports or, or doing whatever else. So, but I don't think their role would be very, very critical in years to come. When it comes to a bigger clinic and once you talk about technicians, technicians jobs are pretty secured because now they are also using technology. They are also using various uh, methods to upgrade themselves and uh, kind of do what they're doing, but with the help of technology. So I guess, uh, like I told you in the last webinar, we all have to upgrade ourselves. Uh, we can't be left redundant. And I guess the question follows what I told last in the last webinar, that we all have to upgrade ourselves and go with the technology, not losing our human touch. But what needs to be all of us, what need to be uh, trained is the method of uh, appearing or communicating through technology, which is very, very important, which is different from somebody who is sitting across the table. The empathy part has to come out through this technology, which is a difficult um, uh, kind of uh, proposition for anybody who's not used technology in the recent past. And uh, because to get adjusted to the technology, to get adjusted to the video and audio together uh, for people who've not used that and to reflect in empathy in our profession is, is very difficult. So that's a challenge with all the doctors are facing now to uh, kind of, uh, yeah, so that's about it. Yeah. So see, empathy is, is one of the bigger factors in uh, life going forward. And that's why I pose that question to you, sir. Uh, but at the same time, you, you made one uh, uh, observation that uh, the technicians got reskilled, right? Yeah. And, and that's the point, that if, if we have to remain relevant in the coming world or the coming uh, scenario, we need to get reskilled. But at the same time, I doubt if companies and organizations can have uh, you know people on the training bench regularly. Uh, so, therefore, uh, please sorry. go ahead. Yeah. So when I meant reskilling, it doesn't actually require somebody to be benched and reskilled. Now with the technology which is coming in and which are actually pretty easy to use, you can take one hour off during your kind of uh, work period or post work to get yourself reskilled. So it doesn't require you to go off work and come back again. It's not that difficult because the technology that people are using and more and more, the good technology platforms are very foolproof. So uh, they're kind of getting people trained pretty easily. So it, it is not very scary proposition as uh, I remember one of uh, the older days when the computer first came into India, people were like paranoid using a, a computer, switching it on to understand even as a simple copy paste would require somebody else to do it for them. But now uh, most of us are equipped to do it. And so the technology, everybody, like I told, uh, I keep repeating myself, technology doesn't require super intelligence. You, and uh, even uh, hence it's called foolproof because you would see the usage of smartphones. Like I told in the last webinar as well, everyone's using smartphones. Smartphones are smarter than us, I hope. So and people are using it pretty uh, smartly. So. <laughs> Uh, and uh, <laughs> you see how people adapt to the new uh, upgradations when a uh, smartphone gets upgraded or uh, your uh, software gets updated. I don't think people actually face a lot of problems using that iOS. So uh, they, they get adapted themselves very fast. So technology for these technicians are also pretty similar. They also get trained on the job. And, uh, uh, and I've seen most of our technicians in hospitals and stuff they're getting trained pretty, pretty fast. And uh, it, it's not a very difficult thing. They only need to know the click of buttons and how to uh, you know, get adapted to them. Perfect, uh, which, which is a, a point, uh, a very valid point. Uh, but, but the thing is that, you know, uh, young people like you can adapt very quickly, but old people like me can't, you know. And uh, I, I've been facing that challenge uh, myself uh, and, uh, you know, like two blind people uh, uh, helping each other, me and Dr. McDougall try to, you know, uh, uh, experiment and try and get over uh, our technology. Uh, in yes, sir. 
please go ahead yes. so behind the so when i talk about technology and you uh, thankfully you called me a young guy so uh, <laughs> so my black hair might be deceiving okay uh, but uh, what i want i meant to say behind adv- advancement of technology or coming up of technology a lot of research work is required and uh, uh, people like you who have in depth knowledge uh, experience and all of that are actually the sole suppliers behind these technology so what i meant to say is that uh, it it is not a scary situation like i keep on telling everybody no, no people even without technology will not go out of circulation they would be the ones behind the brain or the brain behind the technology they would i am a doctor i can't be a software engineer overnight so the technology will be done by a software engineer or a hardware engineer i can only provide them support and provide them uh, kind of knowledge likewise uh, the experts out here will be adding them knowledge and technology ex- experts would being along with them and creating that platform for each other yes paku yes yeah. I, i would like to back you up on that um and and the other thing is that we we kind of think that the younger people have this magical ability to understand the technology more than more than the older people it's not true what's true is that they have more time to study how to use that technology than we do you're a doctor in a hospital um uh Ro- hit you do what you do um uh, uh prof mcdougal you do what you have to do uh prof singh we all do what we have to do we have certain responsibilities the phone is a secondary matter to us it's just something at first when we have it is just something that we can use to call each other what the younger people do is that they have time to sit on their beds play with all the different apps get used to all the different apps get used to different ways of using facebook and linkedin and whatever and they study that they take their time to learn how to do all those things and what they don't know for your your or um your tablet or your mobile the funny thing is that the more you use it the more you suddenly discover something new so they have the time to discover those new things if you have an older person who has the time as well to sit down and discover new things they will learn in pretty much the same way that the younger person is learning but unfortunately we have to pay bills we have to do this we have other things to think of so we don't sit down and take the time to do so and uh, Mag- uh professor mcdugo just proved that earlier on he said you had taken the time to take him through it and he had learned it so when we have the time to take each other um as older people uh through the 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 ways to learn the technology we will we will get that knowledge in the same way sorry um um yeah uh, rajesh you wanted to say something yeah i just wanted to take an example from our medical system the electronic health records when it came into being a uh, 99% of doctors protested against it they thought it was a waste of time and uh, now you see how the, even the senior most doctors have adapted to it it was uh, also forceful but they also understood the value of it and uh, trust me it had, it had come along uh, kind of uh, it it come around 6 7 10 years back and covid is just struck so if those senior most doctors who had no time at all supposedly could adapt to electronic health records where they require a lot of documentation using Absolutely. technology I, i think everybody can it's not it's not rocket science great great right. i want to add, but i want to add one more thing if you don't mind very quickly somebody put in the question there a really important question about accessibility and, yes and, yes uh, quaco will come uh, quaco will okay. come uh, back to that uh, meanwhile i i i i i want to ask a a, a, a question to uh, professor mcdougal you know uh, professor mcdougal uh, all this conversation leads me to understand one thing and that is that uh relearning or learning uh in in our jobs or in our skills to remain relevant is really the responsibility of 
each one of us ourselves it really is not the responsibility of our organization because they cannot afford to right now if if that be true and i think that is true given the commercials behind this and which we will not go into uh, that at the moment but uh, if that be true then in a country as vast as india in a country with so many people you know uh, who who potentially need to be and i'm not talking of uh, the I, i'm talking mostly of the uh, white and blue collared not the no collars right now but in the in this uh, uh, vast uh, you know sea of humanity which needs which may need to be uh, retrained uh, do you think and you're a master of this i know or uh, do you think a, a concept like a study circle would really scale or help to scale <clears throat> of course i mean i think that's that's i mean that's brilliant the way you put that um a couple of things that came up up you know just i just want to refer really, back really quick and quickly to what quaku said about the reason why young people have accelerated with this um new technology i wanted to to just put a footnote that not only do they have more time but they've been relatively speaking they've been at it longer um mm-hmm. they come into a world in which every in which all their peers are already using this stuff they're what so we call the digital the native we, they're right. what we I call mean, the yeah, digital right. native yeah right right we are and we are the we're the colonizers or the i don't know what we are but but they we're trying to learn a world that they were born into the world we were born into was different um and so our learning processes and our baskets of information are arranged somewhat differently um so we have to keep that in mind the other thing i wanted to note too is in terms of what uh, dr baraji was saying about you're not going to need receptionists what i've seen with these kinds of telemedicine things that are going the receptionists are beginning to put in a kind of a human factor that wasn't there before um they are the doctors have their skills and their professional expertise but they don't know how to talk to auntie you know and so like the receptionist is figuring out what the person's problem actually is in addition to following up and making sure they you know keep up with their appointments they they're the skills are beginning to expand the set of apprentice thing i was talking about they're beginning to learn more and more about what does the doctor want to know from this person how much can i aggregate that information to hand it on to the doctor to make this person's care you know better and better and the last thing is the empathic piece um that human connection i mean i mean my my wife for example uh, beverly she's She's like an executive assistant at in the psychology department at UMBC. She's right downstairs right now working doing the kinds of things that we're talking about. And she's very good at like pulling people together in groups and making things happen online because she's, you know, younger than I am. A kind of empathic connection and learning that's all somehow coming together. I think once people realize how valuable she is she's going to be making a lot more money than i am um because i think that's what you need but anyway back to uh, roet's question um and and whether or not it's our responsibility as individuals to learn all of this stuff i don't think that's the case um i think one of the problems with mass society and modern society is that it has atomized us into individuals we think that we're individuals when in fact we're all connected um we're certainly all connected globally in terms of what our minds and our emotions and our and our bodies and our physiology can process one of the things that i've written about is that we're really only capable of of managing empathic connections with about maximum about 20 people at a time it's genetic i mean they call them fire circles it's like the number of people who could sit around a fire and be warmed at the same time that's where our conversation and our gossip was taken well, that's a great We're name in, that's a great name for it. it it it's science i mean this is what the the paleontologists is what they're calling it. um i mean that's what study circles grew out of so it's it is not just up to us individually 
because if we are just operating individually, none of us are going to survive. Um, our physiology trains us that we have to survive at least in groups, family size, fire circle size, study circle size. And so I think one of the challenges is how we get people to kind of relearn that fact that is innate in our own biology, which is that we need each other. But we don't need, we don't need every Catholic in the world. We don't need every Muslim in the world. We don't need every black person in the world. We don't need, you know, what we need is people who are close to us. The, 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 the elites that have emerged to manage us have convinced us that only people who are like us, as they say we are, are, are like, like all of us are Catholic, all of us are Muslim, all of us are white, all of us are this, that. As long as they get us to believe that our future is invested in these large groups of people that nobody really knows how to connect with except the people at the top, we're in for a problem. I mean, you know, again, the pandemic, that we've suffered have, have been a function of the fact that we live in such large scale aggregations. You know, that plus we live right next to the animals that we eat. We never used to do that. You know, we, you know, we didn't counter an animal, we kill it, we eat it, and then it's, you know, but we have them, we're raising them. And think about how many plagues, and we go back to the bubonic plague with rats. I mean, how many plagues, how many viruses, how many pandemics that have affected humanity have come from animals? come from we because we're living too close to them, right? We, you know, we keep them in captivity. We manage, and I'm not saying that we have to change all of that, but we have to think about what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. So short answer to your question, Roy, is that we, we don't, it is not our responsibility as individuals. Um, we are responsible for each other, but we can only be responsible for each other in groups of a certain manageable size. Got it, got it. And, and that uh, really... Um uh, substantiates uh, our, our own uh, whiteboard labs uh, desire to form whiteboard lab study circles and which we'll uh, discuss uh, a little later we'll announce maybe in the next one but uh, we are definitely looking at that in in, in uh, trying to scale our entire uh, learning platform uh, through study circles to uh, every viewers but meanwhile I have a Rod, question. Rod, Rod, I'm sorry. Rod, I'm sorry. One footnote. Take take a note. I think we talked about this. Take a note from UNISA, the University of Southern Africa. Sure, um, I'll do they've that. They've been doing different. They've been yeah. doing distance learning since before apartheid, and yes. they use study circles and kind of they have regional campuses where they do. Sure, things. sure. I, I'll do that. But uh, I, had, I had a uh, question for uh, Professor uh, S. P. Singh. Uh, so. Uh, how does one unlearn and then relearn? <laughs> and that question actually is from um, uh, Dr. Bhattacharji. <laughs> I, I'm just uh, voicing it. I think it's always a process of uh, learning invariably shuffles our neural pathways. And unlearning is a part of that. So we never actually can unlearn a thing technically given the exact literal meaning of the term. But as we continue to learn new patterns, uh, our prior experiences will come handy. Sometimes it takes us more time if it is a contrary learning. But later, later on, it is, uh, it is found that if we gain a contrary, the, one of the process of adult learning is that we continue to argue, to raise questions, to arrive at solution. And as Professor MacDougall talked about, the, the tremendous power that human mind has is the power of inductive reasoning. Uh, when we see something working, we can immediately induce and drive a general principle and commit our coalition to it and thereby adapt it. And I think as we do that, and as we discover the joy of do, doing that, the new neural pathways are created and they are eventually asserted. You see, initially we need to understand this whole thing that goes on in our brain. And uh, I would uh, go back to Sigmund Freud's The Pleasure and the Pain Principle. It is the amygdala that would always bring in negative emotions when we try to do something 
that we were not doing initially but then we also have a pleasure principle in nucleus accumbens when it gives us the joy the thrill and the kick of doing something new we eventually tend to gravitate in that direction and even our earlier experience you know how knowledge chunks are formed is something very mysterious and that has led to a lot of scientific breakthroughs and discoveries because all the knowledge that we acquire in some way it contributes the earlier learning also contributes to the later learning only thing is that new behavioral patterns it takes lot of time to reskip that when it comes to skill and behavioral patterns thank so, you dr singh and so all uh, that we need to do yeah all that yeah. we need to do is uh, break the big task into small task find excitement about it celebrate it integrate with the life adapt it and eventually we find that we have learned a new pattern leaving behind the old one or modifying it in wherever it was required so the question actually came out from the fact that if you see most of the question and answers in the chat which are happening it's 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 the fear of learning something new so i actually wanted the panel to uh, give some encouragement to the viewers and the kind of participants of this uh, webinar uh, not to overcome the fear and actually look ahead and not to be scared about learning something new so hence the question was that how to unlearn and relearn it's basically how to resolve solve the conflict that i can't do it so how to overcome that so hence uh, uh, this question came coming back to our uh, topics uh, um, kweku yes you promised to tell us about scrum so how about that so scrum fits in when uh, dr sir professor singh was talking i said to myself has he learned agile because what scrum agile scrum is all about is about changing mindset and the way we do things and the way we work and it's based on the empirical process and the per empirical process is plan to do something actually doing that thing that as you do that thing you learn so much as you do that thing and you allow what you have learned to guide you to do the next thing so you're using empirical evidence um the empirical process all the time it's called empiricism in order to go forward it means that you're always doing the right thing at any given time because you are being informed by what you are doing and agile scrum therefore is designed for complex complex situations or complex problems that we have to find solutions for and it breaks those complex things down into small manageable components and as you do each component you learn and you're continuously improving the ways in which that you are working so it's based on an iterative approach that means you do the same thing over and over again to become more expert at it what do they say they say practice makes perfect so iterative you're you're doing the same thing over and over again but at the same time you're having incremental gains in order to to get better and better and better at doing that thing and for the last 30 years agile scrum has been in the industry india has taken it on and is teaching the world Uh, agile scrum and uh, we are bringing it to africa as well and it's the Thank new you. way of dealing with situations it Thank also you. it it also helps people learn new things absolutely um, uh, and, and that's the point the that we wanted to come to how do you exactly. learn new things how do you learn on the fly and uh, how what do you do with what you've learned right, right. Uh, and it's and and it's back to the point that professor singh was saying so you don't actually unlearn what you do, what you've been doing but you begin to do new things and you get used to doing those new things and those new things then become the pattern and the habits that 
a new habit. And so what you used to do is always there. And in fact, as you're learning new things, if you slip and don't continue, you will quickly gravi gravitate back to the old way of doing things. So you've got to continuously practice and perfect that new thing that you're doing so that it becomes, so that you embody it and it becomes a part of you. And it's that constant practice, that constant doing that helps you to learn. But you never quite unlearn what you already have. Okay. Uh, 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 Ron, Ron, could I could I just make a point really quickly? Sure. Um, quick, what Baker said about and, and Dr. Singh too about unlearning. Um, if if we go back to my kind of parable of the baskets, you know, the Google baskets, um, there's a way in which everything that we've learned continues to be relevant um, because not because we should continue to do things the old ways or like what Quaker said, old habits, but the information and the patterning of information that we have learned earlier may be useful when looked at in a new light. Uh, one of the things that uh, Eric Erickson, a psychologist who was uh, one of Freud's disciples, talked about was how things that happen to you, let's say, when you're 10 years old, look to you one way when you're 10 but they look different to you when you're 20 or 40 or 50, not because what happened to you changed, but because the way you look at it changed. And the way you look at it is changing all the time because of the new things, the process that Kweku um, talked about. So this is in some ways a kind of a plea or a, a pitch for us who are older, who have all of this old information that we gathered using old patterns. We're still relevant. Because new people, young people asking new questions can cause the information that we have already acquired to suddenly have a relevance that even we didn't know. As, 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 as teachers and professors, we have this experience all the time. A kid asks us a question. And again, I was a Quaker. I don't know if you, if you if, I was hoping Quaker knew this, but there, was, there is an African proverb. And I don't remember the whole thing, but I, I said, Quaker, that I, I call it knowledge comes in twos. That is that knowledge is kinetic. That is that the answer to a question is as much the outcome of the, of the intellectual process of the person who asked the question Absolutely. as the person who gives the answer. Is there, is there a proverb? Isn't there a proverb like that? There is a proverb like that. And it goes like, um, uh, the person who asks the questions learns as much from the answer. That oh, absolutely. Given. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that's so true. That's so true. And uh, right. uh, at this time, I think uh, we are nearing the end, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, the am I, I allowed to say something very quickly in answer to Raja Sheikh? Uh, yeah, sure. Very okay. Quickly. Okay. We, we, need to, we need to wind up now. Uh, so, yes, yes. People, please, please go ahead. Some, some, some people are afraid of learning. And I wanted to say about those people who are scared of learning, if you're scared of learning, then you're dead. If you're scared, because every day that you wake up and step out and come back in, every day that you interact with your family and children, you're learning something new. But you're not afraid of that because it's comfortable for you. So you're not aware that you're even learning something new because it's, 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 it's around you, it's familiar to you, it's comfortable to you. So if you want to learn something new and you're afraid of it, like Dr. Singh said, learn a little bit of it. Get used to that and then learn a little bit more and get used to that. So that, that learning is incremental knowledge that you're gaining. That's all I wanted to say. Now, that's a wonderful way of putting it. Thank you, Kweku. Uh, 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 as we are coming to the end, and I think we should, uh, we've been uh, quite uh, uh, long at this. Uh, wonderful ideas, wonderful thoughts, and in uh, in 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 uh, closing, I just want to make one uh, uh, announcement from the side of Whiteboard Labs, and which is this: that for all educators, for all professionals who want to or would like to get into the uh, uh, the cycle of helping others learn, we are starting the concept called Whiteboard Study Circle. It is based on Professor McDougall's theory. Uh, he is the master at it. We've learned from him. And when we learn, we practice. 
Uh, so we are it's putting fast. that forward. Uh, this is this is meant uh, not only to scale the the process of uh, the new learnings that we need to the new teaching that we need to learn, but also to help uh, people who've been laid off, people who've lost jobs, people who want to get into other areas, uh, people who want to create their own, uh, 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 you know, uh, livelihoods. Uh, th th there is a, a, a business model to this. Uh, we'd love to hear back from uh, everyone who wants to get involved in this. This involves starting of small uh, learning uh, centers, uh, virtual learning centers, uh, geographically and regionally, and uh, who can take things forward. Uh, we've got more than 400 uh, learning packages which we are willing to share. Uh, we will help anybody who wants to join us monetize their their experience, monetize the knowledge, and monetize the time. So uh, that is what we can offer. Um, I would like to ask uh, a request uh, Dr. Bhattacharji to close the session and uh, uh, thank you everyone. Yeah. Uh, so Professor McDougall, Professor Singh, Kwaku, and of course Rohit. I believe uh, it was a brilliant, brilliant session. A lot of insights, a lot of learning. Thank you again for being part of this webinar. Thank you from Times Foundation. Thank you from Whiteboard Labs. And uh, uh, till next time, uh, have a great uh, day. Have a great evening wherever you are. Stay safe, live smart and don't go reckless. Take care. <laughs> Thank you everyone. Okay.